welcome everyone uh, to both CSA and uh, IIC. So hope you're having a great time here uh, participating uh, in this uh, summer school and also the campus. Uh, so my name is uh, Partha. Uh, so I'm a faculty both here in the CSA department in the uh, data science. So my group is called uh, Machine and Language Learning or uh, MOL in short. Uh, so the only thing that's lacking in the lab is the food court. So we compensate for that by naming our servers after like you know, popular snacks like dosa, idli, things like that. So there is some analogy there. So uh, I'll uh, talk uh, to you about and introduce the notion of uh, this thing called knowledge graph. Uh, and like, you know, what is it and uh, how we can benefit from it. So the thesis in my uh, group is, uh, the research thesis, is that background knowledge is really key to uh, intelligent decision making, right? So we as humans, uh, we make lots of intelligent decisions throughout the course of our day, right? So if you are like, you know, reading a paper or a chapter in a book, then you can decide like, you know, what's the next document that you should read to enhance your understanding about that particular document, right? Or the topic that you're trying to learn. Or say, if you are investing in the stock market uh, and then like, you know, uh, you have some pool of money, and then uh, to, to decide on that next uh, company that you want to invest in, you will do lots of research about that company, what they do, what their business prospects are, who are the leaders and things like that, right? So in order to make all those decisions, uh, non-trivial decisions, uh, we make use of our knowledge about the world, right? So uh, our common sense knowledge, how things are related with each other in the world. And... Um, to, and we have accumulated that type of knowledge, like, you know, even uh, simple things like uh, if I want to lift this particular bottle, how much force I should apply to lift this particular bottle, right? So uh, this kind of knowledge, common sense knowledge, world knowledge, uh, we have been accumulating in our entire lifespan, right? So right from the inside the womb until we die, right? And we are swapping in all that knowledge that we have accumulated over our lifespan to do these tasks better, right? So ranging from lifting this bottle to investing in stock market, right? Now, increasingly with the advances in AI and machine learning, we are asking computers to do the same sort of non-trivial tasks that humans have been doing traditionally. And we want the computers to do those tasks on our behalf, and we want them to do it well, right? So if you think about it, so we are asking them to do the same tasks at the, at the same quality as humans would do, but they don't share that same context or worldview that you and I do, and which we think is very critical to make those tasks better, right? So to do make those decisions better, right? So that seems like a little bit of a gap, right? So we are asking them to do the same thing, but we are not providing them with the same context and same resources that are necessary to, for us as humans to do those tasks well. So that seems a little bit unfair, and there is a little bit of a gap there. And our research is uh, focused on how we can bridge that gap, OK? So is the motivation clear? OK, so let me try to maybe uh, make it more concrete using an example, right? So let's say I don't have time to go and read like 10 different websites in the morning to know like, you know, what has happened or what uh, Donald Trump has tweeted last night kind of stuff, right? So I want a system that will go on the web and maybe like, you know, summarize the news for me so that I can quickly browse through and uh, like, you know, know during my breakfast time what's happening. So uh, it comes like that system comes across a sentence like this, which says State Farm stocks stumble along with Berkshire Hathaway, right? Uh, so what do you think is happening here? How many of you know what is State Farm and what is Berkshire Hathaway? Yes, what are those? These are firms, but like these are agricultural firms or it's a company, right? So it's a holding company and this is another company. This is actually an insurance company. And uh, like, you know, when we are talking about stocks, probably we are talking about like the stock market, right? Uh, so, so like, you know, to make sense of this particular sentence, uh, we need to like, you know, we as humans, when we are reading it, we need to know that stock for State Farm and Berkshire Hathaway are companies. Uh, there is something called a company, like you know, these two are instances of those companies. There is something called a stock market, right? So where these company stocks are traded, there are price associated with those stocks, 
and they are volatile in the sense that they change over time, right? So none of those things are mentioned in this particular sentence, right? So to understand this particular sentence, we are relying on all that knowledge about these companies, about the stock market, about prices, everything, right? So we are incorporating all of those things to make sense of this particular sentence, right? So that's how we as humans are doing, but think about the computer, right? So who doesn't know any of these things, right? So how hard a problem it's going to be for a computer to make a sense, sense of a sentence like this, right? So is that clear, right? Okay. So now yeah, we have understood like, you know, there is something called companies, there are stock markets, prices and all of that. But why is the, so this sentence is implying that there is some sort of correlation, right? Between the stock prices of these two companies, right? So if you want to go that one level deeper to understand what's really happening behind the scenes. So anyone has a guess why their stock prices might be correlated? Any guesses? Yes. Okay, have you seen this example before? Okay, right, okay, so that's exactly the thing. So uh, here, uh, like you know, Berkshire Hathaway is mentioned here, uh, who has a subsidiary company called Heinz, right? So Heinz you may have seen in this uh, tomato ketchup bottles, right? Yes, yeah, so that's the same Heinz. So that's a subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway, and who is in turn insured by this uh, insurance company State Farm, right? So what the market may think, so one plausible explanation could be that like, you know, this uh, 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 stock prices of Berkshire Hathaway are going down because of their subsidiary company Heinz, right? And whatever losses or bad things are happening to Heinz that are going to be consumed by this, their insurer, which is State Farm. So like, you know, State Farm's profits are also going to come down in say the next quarter, right? So their stock prices, so market basically has uh, factored in that particular information, and so their stock prices are also going up, right? So will you agree with me that because we have this kind of uh, background knowledge, like, you know, and you are, you are using that to explain this phenomenon, our understanding of the sentence is actually much deeper compared to, say, 30 seconds before, where we didn't have any clue of why there might be a correlation between these two prices, right? Is, that, is everyone okay with that? Right? Okay. So that's kind of like the goal. So what you see here is basically our knowledge about the world, right? So which is like you know, entities and relationships among them, which is represented as a multi-relational graph, which we call as knowledge graphs. Okay? So in this particular case, we are using knowledge graphs to uh, help uh, derive a deeper understanding of this particular sentence to basically know why there is a correlation between the stock prices. So let them leave alone, even for machines, even for us humans, to make sense of this particular sentence, we needed this kind of background knowledge uh, to make these type of inferences, right? So our goal is how we can, uh, so basically the thesis is that like, you know, if we can make these kind of knowledge graphs, which organizes our knowledge about the world in the form of a graph, like you, know, you can think of as a structured repository, and we make it available, to AI and machine learning agents, then their performance is going to improve significantly, okay? And uh, so our uh, goal is basically how we can enrich machines with this kind of background knowledge, common sense knowledge. So any questions about the motivation, why we are doing this? No? Yes. Uh, yes, so like, you know, there are, uh, so we are not kind of like the first, so there are like, you know, many uh, attempts. Uh, so I'll come to the Google example, uh, but yeah, but that's again like a validation to the fact that like, you know, we need this kind of like a knowledge graph to, uh, uh, like, you know, in uh, to improving the quality of even like day-to-day -day services that we are using. But it's not a solved problem and I'll outline the problems. Okay, any other question? So I'd much prefer it to be a dialogue, you know, two way rather than just me giving a monologue here. Okay, so if you have any questions, please feel free to stop at uh, any time. Okay, so hopefully we are not, uh, we are uh, like, you know, uh, on the same board that we need this kind of knowledge graph. But then the question is, 
uh, where do we get these kind of knowledge graphs from, right? So it turns out that like, you know, there is uh, for all, all possible domains that I care about, there isn't like a knowledge graph that I can just download from the web and start using, okay? So then the question is how do we build this kind of knowledge graph, right? So uh, one possibility could be that like, you know, I hire a bunch of people and then like, you know, make them type all this knowledge, right? So into some uh, database, but that's not going to be very scalable because we have a lot of history to cover, right? Because like, you know, humans have been generating so much knowledge over uh, millennia. So it will take first of a lot of time to catch up. And also knowledge is a living thing, right? So every day, every minute, the world is generating so much knowledge, right? So how do we keep pace with that and like, you know, uh, uh, catch up with that? So, yes. Yes. Right. 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 So it's a very good point, but I'm not saying uh, like you not know, to just uh, uh, explain this. I'm giving you kind of maybe like a black and white type of a uh, factual knowledge, but the knowledge need not be always binary. Right. That it's either true or false. So in many, many cases, like, you know, you have subjective opinions, right? So is like sugar healthy, right? Some people will say yes, some people will say no, but you can incorporate all of that maybe by uh, preserving additional context in those uh, uh, beliefs or like the, uh, the knowledge fragments that you're storing here, right? So maybe in each one of these edges, I could uh, store also the source from which I'm extracting them, right? So I could like, you know, keep both your belief and my belief Right? But also attribute and keep the uh, sources of like that this is your belief and this is my belief. And then end applications, whoever is using that, maybe they can like you know, use that context to make that discrimination and use according. Right? Yeah, so that's a very good point. Even though I'm kind of like, you know, uh, just to keep things simple, I'm talking about factual knowledge, which tends to be either black and white, true or false, but it, that need not always be the case, right? So you could also uh, represent uh, more uh, kind of like gray area type of facts, uh, which are which don't have a clear answer one way or the other. Any other question? Okay. So uh, so our uh, uh, so like you know, in terms of building this graph, like you know, where do we start from? So one thing is that like you know, we as humans, we have been documenting our knowledge, right, by writing these documents uh, on the web. Right? So we are writing all the like, you know, blog posts, email, tweets, uh, like you know, news uh, websites and all those things. So uh, through, right, through uh, writings in natural language, like you know, English, Hindi, Spanish and all, so we have been documenting our knowledge and making it available. Right? So the thought is that somehow if we can tap into like, all that unstructured data, which is written in natural language, and somehow go from that purely unstructured form to this kind of structured knowledge repository, that that gives us a more scalable way to build this kind of graphs, right? So that's where, uh, like, you know, we live in an era of big data. So I don't have to tell you that, like, you know, there is tremendous amount of explosion of this kind of unstructured data written in natural language uh, where humans have been documenting their knowledge, right? So our goal is how we can harvest all this knowledge from unstructured data, so go from purely documents which are written in natural language by mining all of that large quantity of data and build basically this type of multi-relational graph which we are calling knowledge graph as you had seen before, okay? So that's that's the problem, right? Okay, so what do I really mean by harvesting knowledge from unstructured data? So out of those say millions and billions of documents in front of me, which are like, you know, either available within enterprises or freely available on the web. Let's say I take two snippets from two documents and one of them says, Luke Revenstall is the current mayor of Pittsburgh. And the other one says, after the death of then mayor Bob O'Connor, Luke Revenstall became the mayor in September, 2006, right? So any one of us reading these two snippets will quickly infer that we are talking about two people here, right? So one is Luke Revenstall, the other is uh, Bob O'Connor, and then uh, we are talking about a location called Pittsburgh, and uh, uh, Luke Revenstall, both of them were basically mayors of Pittsburgh, right? And uh, we are inferring all of these things from these two 
snippets of text, right? But that's not it, right? So what more information is there? About time, right? So they, both of them were not mayors at the same time. So uh, Bob O'Connor was the mayor until his death in September 2006, and then uh, Luke Ravenstall became the mayor, right? So whenever we are talking about harvesting knowledge, we are roughly talking about like you know what kind of entities are mentioned or objects are mentioned in this uh, data, what type of relationships exist among these entities or objects, and how they have evolved over time, right? Because in most cases, this factual knowledge are not universally true. Right, you know, Barack Obama was president of U.S. from certain date to certain date, so he's not president anymore. Right. So, uh, as uh, someone uh, also mentioned, uh, like you know, so use of knowledge graphs and like you know, research in this area is not like any abstract academic pursuits anymore. Right. So, in fact, uh, starting from around like 2012 or so, whenever you search something on Google, you may have seen this kind of panel on the side. Right. Has anyone not seen? Right? So every one of you have seen, right? So, uh, so in this case, I was just searching for Barack Obama, and now I can quickly learn a lot about him. Like, you know, what's his, uh, where he was born, what's his height, uh, children's name, siblings' name, and all of that. So, to get the same amount of overview about this particular person, I don't have to go and like read his Wikipedia page or ten other sites, right? So that immediately improves my web search experience. Right? And hopefully your, it has also improved where your uh, web search experience. And this is actually called a knowledge panel. Okay? And this knowledge panel from an under, is being served from an underlying knowledge graph uh, that Google actually acquired from other company called Freebase and then internally expanded. Right? So this, uh, like you know, for the last couple of years now, you are actually already a beneficiary of knowledge graphs, right? uh, as someone else was also pointing out. But this is not a solved problem, right? So when I surf, search for Kumela, I don't see as rich a knowledge panel as, uh, say, Barack Obama, right? Uh, like, you know, I would like to have to see, like, you know, when, when the last Kumela happened, when is the next one? It's like the biggest congregation of people on earth uh, in terms of a religious festival. And then, like, you know, so all these details are missing, right? And Google also acknowledges that. So according to their ex CEO, they're still at 1% of that knowledge graph problem. Uh, that was 2013. Maybe like you know, linearly they're at 5% now, right? But the hope is that like, you know, when Google with all their technical and financial resources are saying that they're at 1%. So it means two things. So one is kind of like, you know, it's a hard, it should be a hard problem, right? Maybe hopefully otherwise they would have solved it. And the other is there is 99% headroom for improvement where we can actually go and contribute, right? And this is actually also a real world use case. And this is one of only one of uh, like you know, many, many, many other applications of knowledge graphs that you can have. Right? So to answer your questions, yes, there are broad coverage use cases like this, but this is not a solved problem. OK, so any questions so far? OK, so uh, I will talk about this uh, particular uh, effort called uh, Never Ending Language Learning. Uh, so that was, that's a project, ongoing project at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. So I was uh, part of that project before coming here, and we continue to do that line of research in my group. So the idea here is to basically twofold. So one is uh, to advance a new paradigm for machine learning. Uh, that's one. And the second is to use that new paradigm to extract these kind of knowledge graphs by reading web documents or web data on a continuous basis. Right? So let's look at the first goal, which is to advance a new paradigm for machine learning, right? So like uh, you may say that like, you know, machine learning has been so successful, right? So it has touched our lives in so many different uh, uh, ways. Uh, but why do we need a new paradigm, right? So if you uh, kind of like, you know, uh, draw the parallels between how machine learning is practiced today and how uh, excellent learners like us humans learn, so there is a big divide between those two. Right? So right now, most of the success in machine learning have come from this specific uh, class of algorithms called supervised learning. Right? And deep learning that you, may, that you have heard is one particular instance of supervised learning. So in supervised learning, basically, you are interested in doing a particular task, right? let's say spam classification, and then you will collect a bunch of data about that particular task. Right? And then you will train your model on that particular data 
and then in, you will use that train model on test data going forward, right? So, and then if you're lucky, in the future, if you get more training data, then probably you will do some periodic retraining, right? But you and I, who are great learners, we don't learn in that type of fashion, right? So first of all, our learning is not fixed to that uh, fixed, like, you know, limited training time, right? So as I mentioned earlier, our learning starts in the womb and it continues until death, right? And then if you also believe in, like, life after, like, uh, death, like rebirths and all, probably it continues even after that, right? So first of all, then the one big difference is we learn over extended time horizons compared to supervised learning, which has very narrow and restricted uh, uh, learning time. And then the other is we also don't learn a particular task in isolation, right? So we learn many different things, many different tasks over our lifespan. And then whatever we had learned in the past, whatever experiences and knowledge that we had acquired there, we basically uh, swap in all that knowledge and see how we can do this particular task better, right? For example, like say, if I am learning how to drive, uh, the fact that I can read the signboards on the side, that's a useful skill, right? And I did not learn how to read signboards uh, when I am starting how to learn to drive. Right? So I've learned that in the past, I've gone through a schooling system, and everything that I've learned during that time is becoming useful at that particular point of time. Right? And then the other is that like, you know, we tend to learn in a curriculum learning fashion. So like, you know, we learn easier things first, and then move on to learn more complicated stuff later. Right? So uh, if a baby is learning how to read a language, then he or she doesn't like, you know, start by reading the newspaper on day one. Right? So I kind of like build up. So the goal here is to basically uh, push for a new paradigm for learning, which embodies many of these properties that have been outlined, right? So learn over extended time horizon. That's where the never ending part comes. And then uh, how we can learn many different things uh, in sequence and kind of like leveraging all the benefits that you could have by exploiting the dependencies that might have among these different tasks. So yeah, so the idea is to build basically a persistent software individual, which will learn over uh, extended time horizons, learn many functions, many knowledge types, either in sequence or in parallel, and learn easier things first and then move on to the more difficult uh, concepts. So as I mentioned, this is also called curriculum learning. And uh, also the more you learn, the more experienced learner you become, your performance should at least not degrade in performance. Right? And also learn from limited amounts of experience and advice uh, and uh, like, you know, so we have access to teachers, but they are not with us 24 seven, right? So we go to school, we get some sort of feedback from them and we kind of like generalize from them, right? So how to learn with limited amounts of supervision. So, so that was the motivation for doing a new paradigm. And then the NEL system is basically one instantiation of that, right? So NEL stands for never ending language learner. So as input, it basically has access to some initial ontologies. So these are nothing but predicates, like, you know, person, mayor of cities. These are different concepts that, like, you know, are with different number of arguments that you'd like to basically know more about, right? For each one of those predicates, uh, so ontology is nothing but a bunch of, a collection of those predicates. And from some seed examples of each predicate, like, so maybe five examples of people, five examples of cities, five examples of people, uh, being mayors of cities, so things like that, right? Uh, this is actually uh, because you want to, again, learn from limited amounts of supervision, right? So not like humongous amounts. And it has access to the web. Uh, so it has about uh, half billion documents that are locally indexed. And also thanks to the search engine companies, it can also issue lots of queries uh, to the web and download documents and some occasional interaction with humans. So given this input, the output is, the, the task is to run basically on a uh, never-ending basis, so 24-7. And uh, so Nell actually, uh, yeah, so I'll come to that. So on each day, we ex expect it to extract more facts, basically more edges in that graph that we are trying to build by reading or consuming all this data. And uh, also, uh, like, you know, over time, we at, hopefully performance should improve, but at least it should not degrade. So those are the two main tasks. So where is NEL today? So it has been running continuously for more than seven years now. Uh, so January 12th is, uh, is NEL's birthday. 
So we also celebrate that in our group. So if you're around uh, here on that particular day, uh, next January, please stop by. So this is the old figure. So it has more than uh, actually 100 million edges in its graph right now, right? So that it has accumulated over these uh, seven years uh, and it's growing daily. And in addition to uh, learning to extract these edges, it also has the capability to do reasoning over uh, those edges, right? So what do I mean by reasoning? So if I say that uh, the canonical example that I use is uh, that Virat Kohli, say, plays for Team India, right? And Team India plays sport cricket. So now if I ask the question, so what sport does Virat Kohli play? Just based on these two facts, what will you answer? Cricket, right? So even if you didn't know anything about Virat Kohli, right? So that, that's because you are basically using these two uh, pieces of evidence, and you are like you know, doing some chaining reasoning over that to basically complete that missing piece, right? So Nell has that type of capabilities, right? So over the extracted knowledge, basically, if you think of it as a graph, if some edges are missing, then it has the capability to basically use the rest of the graph information to do that kind of link prediction along with the type of that particular part, right? So that's really important. So I used to give uh, this example with Sachin Tendulkar earlier, but I have kept pace with time now and transition to Virat Kohli. So, uh, so it also has the capability to extend its ontology, right? So uh, uh, what do I mean by extend its ontology? So it's able to discover new learning tasks, right? So new relations that it thinks is necessary to model that particular domain. So one example of that is, so at some, one point, it learned a lot about rivers, right? So, and what I mean by that is Nell knew a lot of names of rivers by reading, again, documents on a continuous basis, and also in what kind of context people talk about river names, right? So in what kind of context you will talk about river names? Some example. Agriculture. No, like so some sentential constructs, eh? Like so I could say, like, sand sat on the banks of, right? So if I say that, right, so you will know that like, you know, whatever word is coming or phrase is coming after that, that's likely to be a river or some water body, right? So Nell has mined all that kind of uh, knowledge and it knew a lot about cities, right? So similarly, like, you know, names of cities and in what kind of context people tend to mention or talk about cities, right? So by uh, looking at these instances of these two categories, it saw that like, you know, uh, they are kind of uh, co-mentioned in text with probability much higher than random chance, right? So by analyzing all that data again, now it came up with this new predicate called river flows through city, right? So that becomes a new learning task. That's a new predicate entirely automatically discovered by the system, and then that becomes a new learning task. So the task is to now find additional instances of like, you know, river and city pairs where like the river has flown uh, by that particular city, right? So you have like, uh, I guess like, uh, I know at least Brahmaputra has uh, flown by Guwahati and then uh, Ganga probably is by Patna, right? Is that right? I know. Okay. So I also need like a knowledge graph to, uh, I guess, like make factual statements. So that, that, that's what I mean by uh, extending the ontology. So it's basically discovering new relations. So that's a really important for a system like a never ending learner because it may soon become bored with whatever five or 10 predicates we are kind of like specifying up front, right? So it's able to expand uh, its uh, horizons that way. There's of course uh, work done by lots of people. So this is actually a true fragment out of those 100 million edges uh, graph that I mentioned. So this is a true fragment of the knowledge graph that Nell has been, right? So as you can see, the nodes here are uh, entities and the types uh, on the edges are basically the relations that connect one source entity to one target entity. Uh, you can read like Toronto Maple Leafs, their hometown is Toronto, right? Uh, Toronto Maple Leafs is a hockey team who plays the sport hockey and then they won the Stanley Cup, okay? So hopefully it gives you some idea. And uh, so if you're interested, I encourage you to go and look at this URL. Uh, called rtw.ml.cme.edu, where RTW stands for read the web, right? So because it's trying to read the web and then build this kind of structured knowledge repository, you can go and browse the whole knowledge graph and also what kind of provenance was used, like you know, what kind of cues were used uh, to build this kind of uh, uh, machinery. 
So right now in Nell, I think about there are about thousand predicates, like this person, mayor of city, those are called predicates. So there are about thousand of them. And then um, for each one of those predicates, there are about 10 different machine learning algorithms that are working behind the scenes, right? So you have thousand times 10. So 10,000 different machine learning algorithms are currently working. And the system basically gets all this knowledge and uses all this knowledge to train all those 10,000 different learners in every iteration, right? So now you get basically 10,000 new learners and you use those to basically go and apply that on the unstructured data. So get more facts, then you build like a new knowledge graph and that becomes the new supervision for next round of training. Okay? So if you're familiar with uh, uh, EM or expectation maximization type of algorithm, so you can think of this as one instantiation of it. One huge instantiation. Yes, one question. So uh, some of them were manually specified, and then uh, some of them were automatically discovered, right? So the river flows through city example that I gave, and then a uh, musician plays instrument and things like that. So the inference part you are referring to? The inference uh, problem? OK. So maybe one example here could be that uh, uh, GM competes with Toyota, and Toyota is an economic sector automobile, right? So but the knowledge graph doesn't have the information as is that GM is also uh, is an economic sector automobile, right? So what it can do is basically it can learn these paths Right, which are predictive of making that inference that GM is in the economic sector automobile, right? By following this uh, length two paths. Just the small portion of the hundred million right? Yes. So it has to start from somewhere. Right. Where does it start from, and how does it reach to the place it has to start for the expectation of the? Right. So, um, so you already know, say, the relationships that you are interested in, right? <laughs> So uh, in this case, like, you know, uh, company works in economic sector. This is the relation, right? So when you have that relation, you know that your starting point is a company, and then your ending point is you know, economic sector, right? So you have types of all of those things. So your starting point could potentially be all companies that are there in your knowledge graph, right? So for Toyota, you already know, but for GM, you don't know, but that particular edge is not incident, right? So then you could use this inference mechanism to basically filling that missing piece, right? And uh, hopefully you uh, recognize that all paths are not equally useful for making this inference, right? So in this particular case, uh, everyone sees this example, right? So GM competes with Toyota, Toyota is an economic sector, then with high probability GM probably is also in that same economic sector, right? Everyone is okay with that? But I cannot apply this kind of like, okay, that like you know, every time I see like a length to path, I'm going to fill a particular edge, right? For example, GM competes with Toyota. Toyota acquired Hino, right? So that doesn't mean that GM also acquired Hino, right? So that's why there is a discrimination problem there. So you have to figure out what paths or what subgraphs are useful for making a particular inference because all paths are not equally predictive of all possible different relations. Right? So that's a learning problem on its own. And, but the good news is that you don't have to provide additional supervision to, do, uh, to, do, to learn these kind of uh, inference mechanisms. Right? So just based on the graph itself, it should be able to train uh, to do these kind of inferences. Any other question? Yes? Uh, yeah. Like, yes. So some, some but who knows, right? I mean, that's your opinion, right? So in the newspaper thing that they are saying, that's their opinion, right? So that's what I was trying to say. So the knowledge graph could uh, basically uh, store both of those two views with proper attribution to the sources, right? So you can say that Rahul Gandhi is a good politician according to news websites X, Y, Z. And then you can also say Rahul Gandhi is not a good uh, politician uh, according to UN whoever else, right? 
So it can you can store that context and like you know there could be many different types of context. So the source is one context, but like you know time is another context, right? So as I was saying earlier, that uh, like you know not everything is true all the time, right? So you still want to keep that particular edge, but store that uh, context of time to say that like you know only during this particular time or in this context that particular fact was true. So now it's up to the job of like you know whoever is consuming that data, right, to do these kind of inferences or something else to basically also use that context uh, in a meaningful manner, right? But your job as a knowledge graph is to basically uh, like you know preserve all these different viewpoints as best as you can, and then like you know make it available to whoever is trying to make use of it. But afterwards, it's their responsibility to use it in the right way as they see fit. So your goal is to not to present like you know one curated, uh, cleaned view of the world because that doesn't exist. Right? So we live in a messy world. So there is no one clear like you know like God's knowledge graph if you want to see. Right? But the idea here is to present these different views. Yes. Okay. If you yes. want to know about Toronto, yes. if you give the keyword Toronto, it right. directly does not uh, come to the node Toronto. Right. It has to start from somewhere and travel some algorithm or some I mean, method. I mean, you can have some retrieval on the nodes, right? So you can have an inverted index going from, say, the nodes uh, to their node IDs. So if, like, if you're giving some query, just like you do in a database, right? So there you can do some uh, inverted index retrieval on the nodes. What do you mean by lower? Slower. Slower. Oh, okay. Uh, so sure, you have like you know more things to do now, right? So like you know your data is becoming larger, but you could, uh, but in many cases it like you know, it's easily parallelizable, right? So many of these things you can learn in parallel. So as long as you are increasing your computational resources to process all of that, uh, you should not suffer significant uh, slowdown in degradation, uh, like, you know, in steps of speed up. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so NEL currently is about 80 to 85 percent correct, right? Right, so that like, you know, so uh, basically whoever is consuming the data, they basically have to know that this is not like a perfectly, uh, like, you know, 100 percent correct knowledge graph, right? So that's basically a responsibility of uh, like, you know, whoever is trying to use it. I mean, of course, the goal here is to like you know make it as accurate as possible, but probably that's like a, we are far off from achieving that goal, right? So whoever is consuming this knowledge will have to know that like you know there are errors here, so they have to do something additional to make sure that like you know the errors are handled in a problem in their application context. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so yeah, so right now there isn't like much support apart from storing the context for the opinionated, opinionated facts, uh, uh, but you could potentially kind of like, you know, when you're specifying these predicates, you can say that like, you know, uh, instances of this particular predicate could be opinionated. So you should like, you know, try not to, when you're doing this conflict resolution, like, you know, multiple possibilities for that between two nodes are possible. Right for that that one predicate, right? So you could uh, like you know, incorporate those kind of additional information in the representation itself. Any other question? No. Okay. So if you are also on Twitter, you can basically uh, follow Nell. Uh, this uh, Twitter handle called CMU Nell, uh, where actually there are a few thousand for human followers. So we think most of them are human, uh, and they also give feedback because Nell tweets from time to time. Uh, facts that it thinks is interesting, uh, but not always politically correct. Uh, but people give feedback. But that's a really, I think, an interesting setting because here you have an AI agent and a few thousand followers, and there is some communication happening between these two, right? The question is, how do you exploit this communication to improve the system further?
Uh, so, by the way, this uh, need for knowledge is not uh, new, right? So, people in AI uh, broadly have uh, felt this need, right? And there have been a few past attempts. So, in this particular slide, I have tried to basically organize those previous attempts and how NEL basically fits in to those uh, uh, in the bigger picture. So, uh, the PsyCorp and Freebase. Uh, so, there's, those, those are two efforts. So, PsyCorp was much earlier, that started around uh, 80s. So these are user contributed, right? So we are basically like enough you know, people were uh, recruited to type in all this particular knowledge. So that's why I put them in the high supervision end. Uh, then uh, there was this uh, other effort called Yago from MPI in Germany, uh, which, which was primarily Wikipedia focused. So there, like, you know, in Wikipedia, you may have seen that info box on the right hand side, right? Or that category information at the bottom. So there, the idea was to basically how we can organize all of that data along with some other uh, databases. Uh, so here, the starting. So here, everything was user contributed, typed in. Here, it was semi-structured. So the starting point is like you know, some organization is there, and you want to organize that data better. So Nell, and which also later inspired this Google effort called Knowledge Vault, uh, was probably doing the most ambitious thing because they were uh, the starting point for these systems was purely unstructured data, right? Which are written in natural language, although the end goal is the same, which is basically we want to get these kind of knowledge graphs out, okay? Uh, so that's why uh, NEL and Knowledge Vault I put in the low supervision uh, region. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, uh, we had a paper in AAAI 2015, uh, so where we had documented the lessons learned and like you know, some open problems and things like that. So I, if you're interested in this area, I highly uh, encourage you to look into this paper. So uh, uh, while we were writing the paper, we also did some evaluations. And just to show you that like you know, with time uh, on x-axis, which is the number of iterations you can think of as a proxy for time, and y-axis is the number of beliefs, number of edges in the graph. So you see that like you know, over time, the size of the knowledge graph has increased, not always linearly. Uh, so this is a good sign, right? So here you have a system which has been uh, learning and extracting this knowledge, and it's, it has been able to get more and more facts over time. But it doesn't uh, like you know, paint the whole picture because I could be just like you know, randomly adding edges to my graph and claim that like you know, I have increased over in size over time. So we also did some quality evaluation, and then we find that like you know, over time, also the quality has not degraded, right? So it has kind of like hovered around. 80% uh, ranging from 80 to 85 percent so this is really interesting because here you have a, a system which has uh, kind of like you know running primarily self-supervised uh, over an extended time horizon so so far it's about seven years right and uh, so and uh, while doing that or well, even after running for so much time it has not had like you know semantic drift that it's kind of like you know learning some junk stuff which is given by this accuracy estimate and also, it has been able to gather more and more uh, knowledge uh, by uh, reading these kind of documents. Right? So this is really interesting. And as far as I know, uh, this is probably like the only effort in human history, if you want to call it, where we are like, you know, this is kind of like a self-supervised system, which is primarily working on its own and is able to basically do uh, whatever Nell has been able to do. Okay, so any questions so far? So I, I uh, wanted to kind of like drill down into some specific things that we have been doing in our lab after this, but uh, before going there, any questions about NEL, why we need knowledge graphs and all of those? No questions, everything is clear? Oh, we basically did some sort of like a random sampling on a per predicate basis, and then we did like human evaluation of saying like whether those particular facts are correct or wrong. Uh, we have, but that's an important problem, and uh, so uh, I have one uh, student, Prakhar, who recently just completed his uh, master's thesis on how we can basically do better evaluation of knowledge graphs when you have limited amount of budget, right? Because I have this hundred million graphs, but I have only hundred dollars. How I can make best use of that hundred dollars to get a best estimate of the accuracy? So I'll briefly touch on that towards the end of the talk. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I think like it has, so first of all, some sort of like recency, so something that he has learned, uh, like, you know, recently over the last couple of iterations, uh, and also it assigns some sort of like confidence 
uh, right, to each and every belief, although those numbers I'm not showing here. So I, I think it's like some combination of those factors. So like, you know, it's confidence in that particular thing, like, you know, whether it has learned that thing recently, and maybe if it like, you know, has resulted uh, in like, you know, lots of things being learned about that particular stuff, or uh, also like, you know, if you, if you have seen that particular fact mentioned about lots of sources in the recent past, so that may also mean that like, you know, lots of people are talking about it, so that may be like an interesting in general. Yeah. Where to go and search? Yeah. So uh, right now, um, uh, in, in case of Nell, uh, it has basically, as I mentioned, like half billion documents that are locally stored and indexed. Right? So in each iteration, it makes a pass over those half billion documents. And then uh, it also can issue queries, right? So if it kind of like hasn't found enough information about particular noun phrase or an entity, then it can also issue queries to the search engines and downloads documents from them to basically enrich them. So it's a combination of those two, offline and online. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so that analysis has not been done, but that could be a great project, right? Because all these, um, uh, the snapshot of the knowledge graph after each and every, I think after every five iterations, that's available from that uh, uh, URL that I mentioned. So like, you know, maybe one of you could take up and kind of like do the analysis, how the knowledge graph has basically expanded over time, right? And uh, accuracy is how they have been affected and things like that. Any other question? Okay. Uh, so I will kind of like talk about, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, specifically about, I'll start off with this, uh, particular work that I did. So these were work done with uh, my project assistants in the lab. Uh, so Yogesh is in uh, IIT Kanpur now uh, doing his master's and uh, Danish is in CMU uh, also doing his master's. So they were both project assistants in my lab. And uh, so the idea here is to uh, do something with social question answer, right? So this is not exactly using knowledge graphs, but uh, it's kind of like, you know, what we can do by analyzing large unstructured data. So what I mean by social question answering is, uh, like you know, many of you are probably beneficiaries of sites like Quora. How many of you have benefited from Quora right, by reading question answers? How many of you have posted questions on Quora? Okay. How many of you did not receive any response for your questions? Okay. So this paper is for three, you three guys, right? So how you could like pose your questions better so that like you know you could get response, right? So. But even before we get to that question, we wanted to understand why like, you know, particular questions on these forums get answered and particular other questions they don't get answered, right? And there could be like, you know, you could think of many different factors. Maybe you are posting the questions on the wrong forum or like, you know, your uh, uh, particular way that you have phrased that question is probably like, you know, not relevant for that particular forum and you need to kind of like, you know, do some sort of rephrasing. So, uh, but before we get into all of that, we are interested in kind of like, you know, what type of questions get uh, asked on these kind of forums, right? Uh, but unfortunately, there wasn't like a taxonomy or different types of questions uh, that get asked on, say, a particular Reddit forum, right? Uh, so, so, so our goal here was how we can basically discover, group these questions in a semantically meaningful manner so that like, you know, if I look at a cluster of questions given by some clustering algorithm, I should be able to say that this particular, this set of questions belong to like an R of type X, right? And if they did or did not get some response, then I'll be able to kind of like, you know, say that like on this particular forum, questions of this type don't get answered or they get answered, right? But to do that, I need a way to automatically discover some groupings among these questions, right? And this work is basically trying to discover those kind of interpretable groupings of questions or clusters of questions. So, uh, like, you know, uh, you're all familiar. So, like, in this case of uh, Reddit AMA, like, you know, someone asked, what's the recipe of White House beer? So, at that point, none other than the president came or maybe his, like, you know, uh, uh, PR team came and, like, you know, answered that particular question. But not everyone is so fortunate 
to elicit this kind of response, right? And uh, like many of you probably have also uh, experienced that. So we are basically, our ultimate goal is to help those people. Because if you think about it, like, you know, these questions are also one way to satisfy your information need, right? We do like search engines to, uh, like, you know, satisfy information need, but question answering forums are also another forum to satisfy that need. And it's not right if, like, you know, some, uh, someone's uh, information needs are not uh, satisfied, so we want to help them. Uh, so, yeah, so as I mentioned, like, you know, many questions don't get answered, so we want to help them. Uh, so uh, now kind of like, you know, going into the technicalities. Um, so one question is like, you know, how do we uh, group these questions into different clusters automatically so that we can do that subsequent analysis of why certain group of questions get answered and certain group of questions don't get answered, right? So now if you are given that particular problem, right? So in front of you, you basically have a bunch of questions coming from Quora, or in our case, we use this Reddit AMA data sets, right? So how will you go about doing that clustering problem, right? So input is just a series of questions, and output are basically different groupings of questions. Uh, and uh, with the requirement that I want those grouping of questions to be meaningful in some way, right? So if you look at some of them, you should be able to say that this is question, this, these are questions of type X, right? How will you go about doing that problem? What class of techniques you could potentially use, yes? You will do k-means method, good. So like, you know, uh, so probably you first of all model the problem as some sort of clustering, right? Uh, you cannot use any supervised learning because we don't know upfront what labels we are looking after, right? So here we are basically trying to discover the labels in some sense, right? Uh, so sure, so for k-means, you have to represent each question in some space, right? So those are called features or attributes. So what kind of features will you use? Uh, I, we classify words. Mm -hmm. Suppose uh, the knowledge will group of words uh, knowledge will specify uh, right. what that means. Then those group will be uh, called a particular class. Suppose X. And uh, when questions are fired, then it will look around for uh, the radius. And uh, if there are any questions belonging to the, uh, those words in that radius, then it will just uh, put the list of uh, like suggesting to uh, Right. So what you are saying is basically you will use the words that are present in the questions to represent basically your sentence or like your words will become features, right? And then you'll use some sort of distance computation in that particular space to do this k-means clustering and that will give you some clusters, right? So that's a very reasonable way to do it. So people started doing that kind of stuff over like, you know, broadly clustering, but they also figured that like, you know, if you are able to basically learn some uh, lower order representation, right? So because if you're doing, doing this thing, what you're calling like in a bag of words, so if I use like a 100,000 most common words, say to represent my instances, then what is the dimension of the space in which I'm representing all my instances? 100,000, right? Because each instance will be represented in 100,000, but of course not all 100,000 words are present in each and every question, right? So you'll have like you know, lots of zeros and some non-zeros, right? So, uh, but turns out that like you know, these kind of like distance computation and all are not very reliable in this very high dimensional space. So there is a problem called curse of dimensionality. How many of you have heard of that? Okay, good, right? So curse of dimensionality means that as you go to uh, like a uh, more and more higher order space, right? The dimensionality of your space increases, uh, things basically become like you know, far apart from each other, right? So to cover that space, you need exponentially more number of instances to do that, right? So the distance computations that you do in a higher order is going to be far more unreliable than what would be in say a lower order space where you like, you know, you have reduced that 100,000 to say 100 dimensions, right? So, uh, so that's why people have looked at a lot of kind of like, you know, latent factorization schemes, right? So that's called and there are many different techniques for that. Uh, so that's broadly, that's called representation learning, right? And dimensionality reduction, if you've heard of it, is one way of doing uh, representation learning. So right now there is like you know, a lot of buzz about deep learning as well, right? So you can also think of deep learning as one way to do representation learning, primarily in the supervised setting. Right? 
Okay. So what we also do basically, like you know, we as as you mentioned, so we kind of like represent our questions in terms of our vocabulary or the words that are present in that particular sentence. So that becomes a matrix, right? And what we do is basically we want to do learn this kind of lower order factorizations, right? And uh, uh, we basically uh, pose this uh, X matrix as a factorization of A times D, okay? So D is your new basis and A are basically the loadings on that particular basis. So you can think of that we are discovering new features, right? So these, uh, each one of these rows here are basically a new feature. So it could be like, okay, does it have this word radius? Is or does it have the like you know? Is it like a geometry related question or things like that, right? But we are not specifying those things up front. We are letting this factorization to discover all those attributes on its own. Okay. So of course, it's not possible to kind of like you know describe all of those details. So I encourage you to look at these references to like you know, get more motivations behind. Uh, what we are doing here. But I uh, can just uh, think of it as like, you know, we are uh, trying to learn a representation of those questions in a lower order uh, space, so like, you know, not 100,000, but like in you know, 100 or 200 dimensions. But at the same time, we want those new features that we are learning, we want them to be interpretable. Okay? So what do I mean by interpretable? And there's like, you know, math and optimization to do that. So I'm not going to go into all of those details. So the semantic factors is basically this uh, A matrix that I discovered as part of my factorization A times D. So D is the basis matrix and A is the loadings on that basis. So when I look at like, you know, a particular column, so this is my new feature or new latent feature that I have discovered. And if I look at the top ranking uh, elements of that particular dimension, so they should basically like, you know, give me some sort of a coherent grouping of those questions. Remember, each instance, each row here corresponds to a question from my data set, right? And my goal was to basically cluster all of them in a uh, meaningful manner. So uh, some other techniques that people have uh, used before is uh, this idea of topic modeling, right? So LDA, have any of you have heard of LDA? Okay, some of you have heard about LDA. So this is nothing but some sort of clustering, right? Where you're basically grouping bunch of objects in some sort of latent topics and you have like distributions of words or items over topics. So LDA is a very popular technique to do that. So we also ran LDA on this question data set from Reddit AM, right? So what I'm showing you here is basically comparison across three methods. So each of these methods basically give you this clustering of questions. So what I'm doing here is randomly picking, so out of those 100 or 200 clusters that these algorithms are giving, I'm randomly picking one cluster and then looking at top ranking two elements uh, of question because each item is a question, right? So I'm doing clustering over questions. Uh, two uh, questions, uh, top ranking questions from each uh, from that randomly selected uh, cluster, right? So if the clusterings are meaningful, you'd expect the top ranking two elements at least to have some sort of coherence among them, right? So I just want to show you that. So in case of LDA, I randomly, it gave me like, you know, say 200 clusters of questions. I randomly selected one of them. And now I'm looking at the top ranking two elements, uh, 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 questions from that particular cluster. So one of them says, how did everyone else in the Fox News studio treat you? Were they hostile, friendly, indifferent, etc." And the other question is, I love your writings. I had read Flight Club Survival, blah, 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 right? Do you think this is coherent? Are they like, you know, roughly, can you think of, are they on the same topic in any way? Doesn't look like, right? There is another method called STM. We have similar problems, right? So, uh, so these are basically, you can think of as baselines. And this is our uh, method, which we call Nancy. Uh, so this is again following the same protocol, right? So now you see this. So I'll ask this, is there any advice that you wish someone would have given your parents that would have smoothed out some of those painful, but less, let's be honest here, funny experiences for you. I'm only 21 and haven't really published uh, anything in places, people, blah, 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 right? So these two things are actually basically young writers asking experienced writers advice about writing, right? So compared to these baselines, now, like, you know, we are able to discover much more meaningful clusters of questions, right? And I'm just showing you two here. If you go and look at the papers, there are far more examples to 
demonstrate this very clear. Right. Uh, so now uh, we basically looked at actor. By the way, how many of you know about Reddit AMAs? Okay, so there basically like you know, celebrities uh, come onto the forum and general people right, you know, ask questions, right? And they can basically decide to choose some, answer some question and not answer some other question. So we use basically those Reddit AMA questions uh, for this analysis. And we saw that like, so we basically took uh, in this particular case, the actor domain, like right? so where the celebrity was actor. And then we found that about 5% of the questions tend to get uh, responded to by the actor. But now, by doing this kind of clustering grouping, we found that for certain clusters, the response rate went up to like 15, 16%, right? Much higher than this baseline percentage, right? And because these groupings were interpretable, now we can find and label that these are kind of like, you know, all adulation related questions, right? So you start off your questions that like, hey, I really like your movie, and then ask certain questions, right? So maybe these actors are like, you know, have their own ego. So if you satisfy that upfront, you're much more likely to get a response, right? And then like, you know, if you ask them behind the scenes, right? So I really that, like that particular movie and that like in that scene where you're fighting with the villain, what is what's kind of like a behind the scenes, right? So if you ask those type of questions, they're very happy to answer, right? Again, response rate of 13, 14%. But if you ask them like, you know, real life or uh, like, you know, favorites type of questions, at least in this particular setting, the response rate was far lower than this kind of baseline rate. So you are able to do this kind of analysis. So my conclusion here is like, you know, if you're chatting with Amir Khan, don't ask him like, you know, who is his favorite actress, right? So that probably will not get responded to. So, but the benefit here is that like, you know, because these clusterings, we were able to discover some sort of semantic coherent grouping of questions, we are able to do this kind of analysis on top of them, right? So if these uh, groupings didn't make any sense, it will be very hard for you to come up with these labels and then get that additional insight, right? So that's uh, basically uh, falls into the problem of how we can learn representations, but in an interpretable manner, right? That's a big problem with current deep learning algorithms as well. So as I mentioned, they also learn representations, right? But if you want to ask the question why a particular decision was made, it's not really clear, right? So that's a big open question now. So our research falls in that category of we want to learn representations which are effective at doing the task, but we want those representations also to be interpretable at the latent factor level, okay? So I don't have time today, but uh, we have also done some work uh, on, uh, so then actually, uh, this should have been 2016. Uh, so like, you know, how do we discover these kind of predicates, uh, going back to the NEL context, of how we can discover these predicates automatically from data. So, so as I mentioned, NEL uh, could discover the predicates when both the categories were known, right? But uh, how, what do you do when you don't know about those categories, right? So you just have unstructured data in front of you, how you can discover uh, those predicates or relations automatically. So Madhav is a PhD student and Uday was a project assistant. Uh, so we have basically a, a tensor matrix factorization based technique to do that. Uh, so if you're interested, you can go and look at that EMNLP 2016 paper. Uh, but the, the, the good news is that like, you know, compared to other baselines, we are able to do significantly better. But also one unintended benefit was that uh, like, you know, we are also significantly faster compared to state-of-the-art baselines. So almost about uh, 11x uh, speed up in this uh, schema discovery problem. So, uh, like, you know, we are talking about, uh, so I'll just kind of like quickly browse through. So do I have like maybe a couple of minutes or I'm already over time, a couple of minutes, okay. Uh, so like, you know, we have been talking about like subjective opinions and all, right? So uh, not all sources are created equal, right? So some sources are good so for particular types of beliefs. So the question is how do you learn uh, credibility of sources for different domains, right? For example, if I want to know like, you know, health related information, probably I'll go to WebMD or Mayo Clinic, but if I want to get like cricket score, then I'll go to like say ESPN or Crickinfo or something, right? So how do you automatically learn this credibility of sources? So right, right now there's a lot of talk about fake news, right? So, uh, so that way we were kind of like, you know, uh, hipsters on this problem because we tried to look at the source credibility problem even before like, you know, source credibility and fake news was popular. 
So we had a AAAI 2016 paper where we basically posed this as an inference over graph problem uh, to identify uh, uh, credibility of sources in a semi-supervised manner. Uh, so I also mentioned about uh, this uh, evaluation problem. So Prakhar, as I mentioned, uh, so he's heading to UIUC for his PhD. Uh, so he looked at the problem of if I have this like you know 100 million edge graph and I only have hundred dollars, so how I could make best use of those hundred dollars uh, to better evaluate, uh, get the accuracy. Estimate. So it it uh, also so what he calls this uh, paradigm is relational crowdsourcing. So it's really interesting because it also opens up lots of interesting uh, doors in crowdsourcing that people had not considered before, uh, and he had some good uh, solutions for that particular problem. And here's an upcoming paper in EMNLP 2017, uh, if you're interested in looking into that. So uh, as I mentioned, so we uh, also do a lot of work on deep learning in our group. Uh, so most of the success, as I mentioned previously, in deep learning have come from situations when you have tremendous amount of training data, right? But uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we don't work in a situation where we can provide that level of supervision for these kind of algorithms to work, right? Because we are interested in hundreds and thousands of different types of knowledge, and we cannot provide millions of instances for each and every type of knowledge that we're interested in, right? So that's why we are working on, uh, so Sharmista, uh, who is a PhD student, uh, is uh, looking at how we can basically adapt this deep learning algorithm to work with limited amounts of supervision or maybe slightly larger noisy, uh, noisily labeled data. So basically cut down on the need of supervision or training data and adapt deep learning algorithms to basically the other end of the spectrum. So she has basically a couple of proposals in that direction. And then um, so conversational AI or chatbots now are very popular, right? So maybe you have used uh, like in you know, a Siri or uh, Alexa or like in you know, a Google Home and all. So where you can talk to the uh, AI agents and they will do something for you. And, but most of the times, these engagements with these agents tend to be very, like, you know, one-off, right? So you ask, what's today's weather? The system will come back and say, what's today's weather, right? But usually when you're kind of talking with a, a friend, that usually results in a much more engaging and free-flowing discussion, right? Hey, that's uh, today's weather, but it's going to, like, you know, rain today, so maybe you should take an umbrella, things like that, right? So our claim is that, like, you know, in order to have those kind of free-flowing, engaging conversation, both the agent and the person needs to share the same view of the world in which we are operating. And again, knowledge graphs provide us that particular context or the world, right? So we are looking at actively how we can uh, use uh, these kind of uh, knowledge graphs to make these kind of conversational agents uh, much more free flowing and engaging. So we have uh, a model called uh, uh, knowledgeable neural conversation model uh, that we have been kind of like testing. Okay, so ongoing research, uh, so like, you know, I talked about uh, Nell, but when I came in, joined here, and I started talking with people from industry, they were like, you know, uh, that's great, but I have these documents from insurance domain or medical domain, right? So how can you build like a knowledge model for this specific domain? So we have been looking at uh, how we can build these kind of knowledge graphs from a, for a particular domain in a goal-directed manner. Evaluation I mentioned, time is really important, so we are looking at how we can add time to these edges uh, in the graph uh, because we want to take time into account while we are doing the inference. Uh, and in general, we have a lot of work around learning representations at scale, well, which are also interpretable, right? So most of the work in our group uh, actually uh, like, involves working with terabytes of data to build models from. Uh, so currently about six PhD students, couple of masters, research assistants, and interns. And uh, although we are a relatively young group, uh, about two, two and a half years in existence, so people have graduated and gone on to do interesting other work, uh, both in uh, industry and uh, universities worldwide. Okay, so we are also interested in uh, neuroscience, but uh, I'm, I know we are running out of time. But the point here is that, like, you know, so far we have been talking about how we can build uh, knowledge models uh, out of uh, large unstructured data. But if you think about it, these documents, are, uh, natural language data, are not machine generated, right? So humans have been writing for the most part, all of these things. So that, so we've been trying to basically focus on this part, but uh, with advances in, uh, and that basically is one view, right? Because something is happening in our head and that is generating all this data, right? 
So with advances in brain imaging techniques like fMRI, MEG, PET, and all, we also have another view into that same latent organization, right? So the idea is, rather than looking at each one of these two modalities in isolation, will it not be nice if we could somehow combine both of these two modalities and try to answer some neuroscience question about like, you know, how knowledge is represented and processed in the brain? So we have done basically a bunch of work uh, in that, with that particular theme, trying to learn representations uh, not only from each one of these modalities in isolation, but trying to align them together. And it interestingly turns out uh, you are able to answer some questions uh, by doing this kind of analysis together, which would be really hard if you were like, not trying to just look at brain data and answer this, right? So one of the reasons is even though brain data might be good and direct measurement, but collecting that data is hard, right? Because if you put people inside scanners and you don't want to be inside scanners for hours and hours, right? But at the same time, on the tech side, even though it may be diluted, but we have tremendous amount of volume of it, right? So they provide that way complementarity. So in this particular case, what you see is like, you know, how people's head become light up when they're reading stories. So previously, people were, uh, research was able to demonstrate which part of the brain become activated when you're reading stories. By the way, reading stories are a very interesting use case because, like, you know, the author is throwing you into this fantasy world that uh, you have... Uh, uh, that you are reading, so you have to keep track of like you know new objects, new relationships, and all of that. Uh, so, but uh, with our analysis, we were not only able to say which part, but what type of decoding are happening in these different regions, right? So that's kind of like going one level deeper, and that also attracted some uh, interest from the popular press. So, uh, just to wrap up, so here I teach uh, two courses. So one is on uh, natural language understanding. So, uh, so Michael Jordan. Uh, just to give you some motivation. So he's like, you know, one of the uh, very prominent researchers in machine learning. So when he was asked, like, you know, if you're given $1 billion, uh, what you would do? So he said that, like, you know, I'll build like a NASA-sized program focused on natural language process. Right? And then uh, according to this Google SVP, a senior vice president, so understanding language is the holy grail of machine learning, right? Uh, so uh, this course will basically set you on path towards those holy grail and those achievements. And uh, so people also in the, through course projects in these uh, courses have like enough to publish papers in international forums. So that's one, so natural language understanding is really important, it's a core component of a lot of the things that I've been talking about, and it's uh, very tightly integrated with uh, learning. And uh, from next semester onwards, I'm uh, starting a new course on machine learning with large data sets. So where the idea will be how we can do learning at scale involving lots of data with uh, different types of characteristics. Okay, so as a final thought, you may have heard about the IBM Watson, which went on to beat uh, humans in the game of Jeopardy. So, uh, like, you know, and uh, if you have to, like, you know, believe all this talk about AI and uh, machine learning and big data, so we feel that we have a really big opportunity to go from big text data sources to these kind of like big knowledge graphs, and through that, basically uh, uh, satisfy or like, you know, bring real world knowledge into AI and machine learning systems which have basically uh, plagued, like the you know, lack of knowledge have plagued these systems for a long time. So we have an opportunity for the first time uh, to basically make advance. And this looks like a really interesting point in time because of the convergence of computation power, availability of data, and advances in the statistical learning techniques, right? And if you think about it, like, you know, in nowhere in human history, uh, these three things came together, right? So we are really excited to be working at that intersection and uh, so our work spans the areas of machine learning, natural language processing, and large-scale data analysis. And through the combination of all three, we want to uh, help machines do better uh, decision making. So we collaborate uh, extensively with outside uh, universities. So the machine learning department at CMU is the primary one. And we have a lot of uh, industrial collaborations. For example, Google Research have been supporting our work uh, right from the beginning. So there's a lot more to talk about. I'm already way over time, I think. Uh, but I encourage you to go and uh, look at our URL, modelabisc.github.io. And uh, if you have any more questions, I'll be happy to address them. Either now or we have a coffee break now, or yeah, okay, over coffee break. OK, so thanks for your time. And uh, welcome to CSA and ISC again. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think all of them would be interested to construct a knowledge graph over what they learned under this session. Yeah, OK. All right.